This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, so what's going to happen if you weren't here this morning? Savannah Shelna is a, uh, a graduate student in Larry Smart's lab. This is her trial. It's a powdery mildew trial. So since it's a trial, we ask that you not take any plant material off of the plant so she can do her work. But I think if we go inside, it, uh, we can look at some of the things we're talking about. And I'm going to talk about bugs today. So may, let's make our way inside the high tunnel. Okay, welcome inside the, uh, the high tunnel here. Real quick, in case you weren't here this morning, a high tunnel is a soil-based greenhouse, and it kind of uh, brings hopefully the best of both worlds of field production, in that we're using the uh, soil as our uh, our substrate, our growing media. Um, but at the same time, in, versus hydroponic, uh, at the same time we're getting those uh, greenhouse benefits of uh, controlling the uh, the environment to some degree. Since we are using the soil and it's a lower technology greenhouse, we are going to probably have um, more insect pests than might happen outside just because we have the soil here. Excuse me, yeah, more than outside because we also don't have rain. So the ventilation is an important feature on, I think, any greenhouse, uh, high tunnels in particular. Um, we use these roll-up sides so that we have air exchange. That air exchange is critical for any crop grown indoors. Uh, it gets more CO2. Plants use sunlight and CO2 to pho photosynthesize, so that air replenishment is important for CO2, relative humidity, and temperature management as well. It also means that insects can come in and out through those open side walls, so we're clear on that. So, to control those insects, we have to think about what are we going to do to do that. Um, I'm going to suggest that we look away from what we call conventional pesticides for a few reasons, hopefully that are obvious to all of you. One is the testing uh, that we just heard about in our previous talk. If you're applying a uh, conventional pesticide to these plants, that might ruin your testing. Um, the next is it's probably illegal. So we don't have what we call traditional conventional pesticides that are labeled for cannabis let alone inside, because many of your pesticides that are registered outside are not registered inside. That means we need to look at other ways of controlling these pests. I'm going to talk about introducing good bugs to control the bad bugs, and we call that um, uh, biocontrol, or, yeah, biocontrol. There is another way to do that as well, and just as you can use uh, what we call microbial fungicides, so in the talk that we just heard from Chris's grad student, where you're spraying either a bacterium or a fungus onto the plant with the idea of controlling um, the pest disease, you can do the same with insects um, using microbials. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about releasing the good bugs in to control the bad bugs. So I'm using the word bugs instead of insects because we're not just dealing with insects, we're also dealing with mites. You may have heard of mites. Mites are insects. They have eight legs. There's a very common uh, pest of cannabis called two-spotted spider mite. We heard about that earlier today, too. That's a pest mite. The reality is there's probably more beneficial mites than there are pest mites. So we actually use good mites and good insects to control uh, the bad bugs, the bad mites and the bad insects. So I'm going to say bugs as a general overall term to include both mites and insects. Another reason you might want to look at introducing good bugs into these high tunnels or greenhouses is if you want to do things organic. So if you have a product that you're representing in some fashion as organic, this is the way to approach that. The other benefit with introducing good bugs here is that it's less labor than spraying anything. Whether that's an organic spray or a conventional spray, releasing insects is less work, I find, than spraying. So, how do we know what to release? Well, the first thing we have to do is figure out what we are releasing for. What are we going to introduce a good bug for? And that means we're going to scout. And to scout, approach one of these beautiful plants next to you and start poking around that foliage. You're free to do that. Savannah, it's okay if they handle the plants, is that correct? She says totally. Totally. Get in there and poke around a little bit. And what I like to do when I'm looking for 
insects and mites, I tend to start at the bottom of the plant, particularly in a high tunnel where we're using soil. And that soil or dust oftentimes is uh, what gets these insects going. So I take a look at those lower leaves and I figure out what do I have going on there. I'm not going to go through that whole exercise. That's generally where I start. Not all of your pests will start on the bottom, but it's a very good place to start looking. And if you look at these cannabis plants, you will find some insect pests low down in the canopy. Now that I've figured out what I've got, well, you haven't figured that out. You figured out you've got something. It's a mite, it's an aphid, it's a thrips, it's a beetle, it's a worm, it's something. You need to figure out, is there a beneficial insect or mite that will control that for me. And so I work with a couple of different uh, biocontrol suppliers that are outstanding sources of information. Uh, I have one here from Arbico and one from Coppert. And these people are used to working with the cannabis industry. They have a lot of information on what are the good bugs that you put in to control the bad bugs. So a brief word on the good bugs. Again, we're dealing with beneficial mites and beneficial insects. We divide those into two major categories. They can either be parasitoids or predators. A parasitoid doesn't eat the bad bug. It somehow disrupts its life cycle. So paras parasitoid wasps are the common example of that. They lay an egg inside of an aphid. And then that egg grows and then a wasp emerges from the aphid. It's pretty neat. That's a parasitoid. Their relationship with the pest is often highly specific. So they might only lay eggs inside of one species of aphid or maybe two or three species of aphids. For that reason, I tend to prefer what I call generalist predators. Predators that eat are bad bugs and they'll eat many of them. So if we look at aphids, we not only have the hemp aphid that, that affects cannabis, you also have hop aphids that will affect cannabis. You have foxglove aphid, you have uh, 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 potato, green potato, potato aphid, lots of them, green peach aphid. And so I prefer a generalist predator that eats all of those. It doesn't care what it eats. And so I'm going to highlight one of those here. This is a green lacewing larvae. And if you look at the picture on this bottle, you'll see what that larvae looks like. It looks like a monster. This thing is a monster if you're an aphid. Lace wings are these beautiful green flying insects in their adult stage with a very lacy wing. And what they do is they fly around this high tunnel, they sense where the aphids have their colonies, and then they lay an egg in the center of that colony. Not inside an aphid, but in the middle of that colony. That egg hatches out, and then this lace wing larvae comes out, and it voraciously goes after any aphid I can find. So I really like this one because it combines two important assets for me in biocontrol. One is general predation, so it eats almost any species of aphid. It eats many species of aphids, and it also has mobility. It flies, and it detects where those hot spots are inside of the, the high tunnel. So I'll pass this around. You can see that. Those are commercially available. You buy that, sprinkle it out into your crop. Actually, Lacewing, yeah, so lacewing larvae are going to come probably as uh, in their larval, or larval stage. This is a, another wasp. The lacewing is not a wasp. It's, a, it's another flying insect. This is a wasp. It's not a parasitoid wasp. It's another generalist. So this is a Phytolides, and it again seeks out where are the aphids, and it lays eggs, and it goes out and, and consumes those eggs. Both of these fantastic generalist predators for aphids. For spider mites and thrips, we don't have that flying advantage. In that case, our predators have to be shaken out, and they'll come in a sawdust carrier or vermiculite carrier, just like that, and I would sprinkle that out into my crop, and they would seek their prey. Some of the common ones we would use for mites, would um, their names, you don't have to memorize them, would be Persimilis, Californicus. Uh, for thrips, we use a, uh, a beneficial mite called Cucumerus. Again, you don't have to learn Latin. You don't have to memorize those things. Talk with your, your biocontrol provider. They can walk you through that process really well. Now, I've got in front of me about 3,000 square feet, Savannah. Is this 30 by 96, maybe? Yeah. Okay. So about 3,000 square feet of growing space. This container has 
probably around 500 or 1,000 um, of these wasps inside that are going to emerge and hopefully find my aphids. A much preferable way to get this product onto my crop instead of treating these 3,000 square feet is to treat my transplant area. So these 3,000 square feet of, of hemp plants, when they're small, are condensed into maybe 100 square feet on a greenhouse bench. So I can treat that greenhouse bench with this, and then once I transplant out into my high tunnel, ideally those plants are pre-inoculated with the beneficial. So when do we treat? We treat early. How often do we treat? That depends on the pest, but we're probably going to treat often. If you're going to go this route, this, this biocontrol route, scouting is important, but I think it's more important to release early. You have to commit to this and say, I'm going to go this route and I'm going to release. If you're growing indoors, it's a hot, dry environment, you're very likely to have the pests we mentioned today, mites, thrips, aphids. Assume that you're going to have them and be prepared and release these early. There's no more words left on my highly sophisticated notes. <laughs> Questions, comments, rebuttals? Yeah. Or would you say that this is, you know, standard for most high uh, I would say it's for trials, but maybe Savannah, Savannah's out here. Yeah, you want to address that, Savannah? Uh, yeah, this is just specifically for this trial. Uh, okay. I can, I'll address, like, why we chose this layout a little bit more in a second. Yeah, will you cover density? Uh, you can talk about density if you want. I was saying about Yeah. I don't know much about density, but I would say we're at suboptimal density. So part of my talk this morning is let's focus on this greenhouse really needs to um, produce as much cannabinoid flour as it can to justify the investment in the steel and plastic versus growing this in the, in the field. So for that reason we want to find what is that optimal density uh, and I'd say we're well below it at this point. Maybe there's a grower in the room who has an idea on density in square feet. No? Is that a trade secret? Go ahead. So the question is, can you rotate these biologicals with low-risk pesticides like Bt? So Bt, for those who don't know, is a naturally occurring, it's a toxin that comes from a bacterium that specifically targets uh, a set of worms. Um, and probably has low activity against many of the species that we're targeting. If you go to the biocontrol websites, they generally show a compatibility chart of does this biocontrol mix well with, say, a BT or another pesticide. My, my approach would be to go with one or the other on that, because in the end you are applying an insecticide when you're using a BT, and it's probably going to have some negative effect, particularly on soft body beneficials that I'm releasing in here. So knowing that I'm going to control multiple species, I'm going to need multiple predators. Um, and I would let them do their work. Judge, do you mind if I soapbox for a moment? I'd be happy if you soapboxed, but it depends on the topic, Steve. What's I'll try and keep the commercial short. Hi, I'm the rep from Marone Bio. We sell Grandivo and Venerate. They are two biopesticides. Thank you. The two biopesticides going to your question about compatibility. Um, we use, we, we've been in the cannabis sector since the very beginning, and um, we use them quite a bit for managing uh, western flower thrips, all the species of aphids, spider mites, broad mites, etc. Um, I like them a lot in a BCA program, and part of one of your evaluation points is you're looking at how to integrate all this mess. One of the things I like about BTs, although they are specific to caterpillars, is the mode of entry into an insect is by ingestion. Most, well, all of our beneficials are not eating your plant. That's what makes them beneficial. And so you're very unlikely with a BT or a Grandiva or a Venerate to actually get any in. And then the mode of action of them is as a stomach poison. So this goes back to if your, if your beneficials are not eating your plants, they're not, there's no way they're going to get any of this product in here. So you can't integrate the two. I find that the whole industry, the whole BCA industry, 
cropped up when there were no biopesticides. Now we have a whole lot of biopesticides. Integrating them, I think, is the real is the real challenge. And I'm talking not just my company, biopesticides, but even though we hate to admit it, there are other biopesticides out there. Um, I see a biosafe rep back there, um, and their products are almost as good as ours. <laughs> thank you all very much. Yes, thank you for those unbiased comments, Steve. Uh, Steve, uh, Rome Bioscience is one of our sponsors today. I encourage you to talk to Steve. He's been in the high tunnel and, and protected crop and outdoor crop world for almost as long as I have been. So a lot of knowledge there. One more quick thought that comes to mind for me is I look at this high tunnel, and as much as I love soil, I don't always want to see the soil. So if I were this were a commercial production for me, I would mulch this one way or another. Either mulch these row middles with, with a plastic film, and there are degradable films you can use today, or with an organic um, mulch, such as straw or something like that. That alone is going to provide a lot of benefits on insect control. It's also going to provide moisture control. It's also going to provide um, weed control. And it's also a nicer working environment for your labor uh, when they're in here doing whatever they're doing. So quick, easy way to control pests or to reduce your pest load is to mulch these row mills heavily. More questions or comments? Behind me? Yeah. So you mentioned uh, Sorry, Mary. controls. Well, I'll repeat it. Go yeah, ahead. Biocontrols. Do I need a pesticide applicator's license for biocontrols, and what about these bio, you know, the actual pesticides? Right. So Marie Ulrich um, from Orange County asks, do I need a license to apply either microbial products or beneficial insects? And the answer is no, you don't. So there's another set of uh, paperwork you don't have to go through, which you don't have to jump through. And again, if you look at that OCM webpage, they're really encouraging you to be as organic as possible. That said, whenever you use a labeled pesticide as a farmer in New York State, you are required to keep a record of that. How much product did you use and when did you use it? And even the organic materials do have what we call re-entry intervals. And you have to respect those. And they have PPE requirements. In other words, you have to wear certain clothing or protective equipment. So, you, you, and are subject to worker protection standards. Mary loves talking about this stuff. She's the one to go to when you have questions on legal things. I'm good for other questions. Thoughts? Comments? If not, I'm probably at the end of my time. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web, at cornell.edu.